You are listening to the Today's Eden Podcast, episode 26. This is where the struggles are real, the callings are heavy, the kids are sticky. We come together because it takes a village, and this is your tribe. Thanks for listening to the Today's Eden Podcast. Today, I'm talking with Chrissy Powers, and she is a mama, a marriage and family therapist, photographer, and also blogger, Instagrammer. She's the jack of all trades, and we get down and dirty and talking all things motherhood, like colic, working from home, going to counseling, finding community over competition, the movie Bad Moms, and anxiety stem from a scary moment where her child went missing. I'm so pumped to have Chrissy on. Let's get to the episode. Hey, Chrissy, thanks for being on the podcast with me today. I am so excited to talk to you about motherhood and basically the 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 whole deal, like what is included in the package of motherhood today. And um, yeah, just kind of chew on that and just talk. Yeah, I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> so before we get into all that good stuff and the messy stuff, Tell us a little bit about who you are, um, what life kind of looks like for you right now, just some details. Okay. Um, so I'm Chrissy Powers, and I am a mother of two, two little boys. Waylon is five, and Zeke is 20 months, and married to Sam Powers. Um, got married about seven years ago. Yeah, seven years last February. Um I am a marriage and family therapist, licensed, I should say, because <laughs> I work really hard for that. Um, and I, I still have this like creative side of me. I always like preface it by saying like my BA was in art, and then I went back to school and got my master's in psychology because I really wanted to work with people, um, especially women. And then um, after. I became a mom, that creative spark in me just like was reignited. And I like, for some reason, this thing had in my mind, I wanted to take really good pictures of my kids. Yeah. <laughs> so I bought a digital camera and I just learned how to use that camera really well, I feel like. And then, um, started taking pictures of my kids. And then a friend was like, Hey, let's start a blog together. And then I was like, what's blogging? <laughs> so <laughs> We started a blog together, which incidentally didn't work out. It was just too hard for being moms and having the same blog. But um, it, I loved it. I just took it and ran with it and just love blogging. I feel like I finally I had a space where I could combine everything that I loved, um, meaning like writing about therapy or relationships or parent parenting. Um, and then I had a place as well to put up my photos. So I was like – and then, you know, be creative. Like I could just – showcase like a DIY or like a cute outfit, but also then write about something like, you know, anxiety and motherhood. And so I really felt like it was just a combination for me of everything that I love. And I'm like, wow, I kind of feel like God, you brought something into my life that was just like me and my niche. So that is, um, that's what I do. I still try to (laughs) everything out, which I can't. So I can't, figure it all out, but I'm learning as I go. Um, and what life looks like for me right now is like, um, lots of being busy and then like trying to learn the balance of like when to not be busy, like when to say no and make just time to like be with my family. Cause I have a hard time with that. Cause I love being productive and I love meeting people and like, having opportunities. So for me right now, life is learning that like balance of like, it's okay to be busy and it's okay to hu- hustle and have work and, and to love it. But then also, you know, when you're married and you have children, you have to think of them too. So I'm learning <laughs> the balance of slowing down for them at certain, maybe it's just certain times a day. Maybe it's like a certain week where I'm like, okay, I need to say no to more things. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of what life looks like right now for me. Don't you feel like when you sit down, like when you decide you're like, okay, I'm not going to do anything between 10 and 1, then the whole time you're sitting there, you're like, I could be doing, <laughs> like there's things yes. I could be doing or you feel, and I feel like that's where that like mom guilt comes in where we start to think like we should either be folding laundry or if you have yep. a like a side hustle, you want to be like, 
you know, for you, it'd be like blogging or working on future posts to come out and totally. And there, yeah, that's the balance of it is like, sometimes my oldest, he like, you know, in the morning loves to sit and watch a show and he's like, mom, you can sit with me on the couch. And so I know I need to do that. And, and he loves physical touch and just affection. So I'm like, okay, that's really important Mm -hmm. to do that. And sometimes he'll say, mom, you can bring your computer on the couch and do your work. (laughs) And I'm like, should I feel bad about that? Yeah. <laughs> feel, like it's okay because he knows that, you know, moms can have jobs too. So and I feel like I I can I often go to bed feeling guilty. Like, did I give them enough undivided attention today? Um, and I take that as like a signal for me that maybe the next day just be more aware of it. But then also I don't want to beat myself up for like maybe one time having to sit on the couch with my computer to edit photos because mom's hustling, you know, and if he's watching TV, that might be a good time because we're both doing our thing. So I think it's a give and take. I think it's, um, not every day has to be perfect. Not every day has to be like, I don't know that slow motherhood. It's like a new movement yeah. <laughs> that I'm I, I like it and I want to be that, but I can't always be like that because sometimes I do have to work mm-hmm. um, or get or meet a deadline, you know? So, yeah, I think it's like being gracious with yourself and um, then also, you know, just trying to be aware of um, what really matters. Yeah. Have you ever had a struggle with like that negative self-talk we can sometimes do to ourselves when it comes to working? Like, you know, I I feel like in motherhood, we just compare ourselves a lot. And so there's like this um, invisible, uh, I don't know, comparison between like stay-at-home moms and working moms. And so I feel like for me, even though I'm at home and I'm still working from home, like sometimes there's still that like internal struggle of like, what should I be doing? Or is this the right thing for me to be doing? Totally. Cause I grew up and my mom was a, you know, fully stay at home mom and I loved it. Like I found so much safety in that. And so when I became a mom, it was like so important for me. I felt like to be there for my kids, Mm -hmm. um, because I felt like I wanted to give them that. And I know a lot of moms, you know, have to work nine to five jobs and, I think their children are going to be totally fine too because I think it, what matters is the love that you have for your children and how you show them that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I feel like we live in such a different age where I sometimes think or I say to my mom, I'm like, gosh, it must have been so nice. You just had like a phone with a cord <laughs> attached to the wall. Like you didn't have a phone in your hand all the time. Like you didn't have that temptation or that pull. And, um, you know, I'm sure they had other things, but like, sometimes I do envy that, that that these temptations just didn't exist then. But then I'm like, okay, it's just kind of pointless to go back in time and, and, and think about that because my children aren't living my childhood. They're living their childhood and they're Mm -hmm. living in a complete different age. And they're going to have to learn how to balance these devices and, and time and work, um, and family as well. So it's like, okay, well maybe they, they will learn through our example as like working moms, um, or working stay at home moms. Cause that's kind of what I feel like I am. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah working stay at home <laughs> mom where it's like, it, it is definitely hard. I do have to, I do struggle sometimes with that negative self-talk of like, okay, you know, what am I even doing? What am I like? I like to think I'm providing. And like, I always think of that Proverbs 31, 30 woman. And I'm like, that's what I want to be. You know, the woman that like gets up early, (laughs) although I don't, (laughs) I don't get up too early unless I have to, but, um, you know, and it's just, you know, once I just want to provide for my family so much, um, and, and give them, you know, a wonderful childhood. So I think that's where that comes from. And, um, yeah, I think that negative self-talk, um, you just have to bring it back to, did I show my child enough love? Do they know their love? Do like, what's my relationship with them like? And overall it's pretty good, you know? Yeah. That's what you have to come back to. And it, and if it's not, if the relationship is struggling, then that's when you need to figure out, 
um, what would strengthen this relationship? Maybe it is more one-on-one time with them, or maybe it is just like sitting next to them and watching the show they like. Yeah. And I feel like the working stay at home mom, like that lifestyle is a whole nother beast in and of itself. So you have like the stay at home mom, the working mom, and then the working stay at home mom. Um, Mm -hmm. because you know, you're either at home with your kids and you're focusing on them and, um, you know, you might have a few things for yourself to do or for the family or for, you know, some other pursuit outside of that, or you go to a place of work outside of the home and you're not distracted by your kids while you're working, but when you're working from home, then you are distracted from your kids yep. while you're working. And so, <laughs> and because you're surrounded by them, you feel that guilt constantly that, you know, because they're there that you should be engaging with them. Um, versus I feel like when you're, you know, working mom in an office, you still have that guilt that you just want to be with them. But you know, now when you're a working stay at home mom, you have that guilt that I should be engaging with them because they're 10 feet from me. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that like going back to having a different childhood than my children, I think that's where maybe the guilt comes from because we didn't see that a lot growing up. Um, and now we like, my husband will even say to my son, Um, you know, mommy's working right now, even though I'll be in the room, like I might have to have the computer open. So yeah, my husband will even, um, say mommy's working right now. And that used to irk me so badly. I used to get so mad at him for saying like, don't say that I'm here. I'm present. I'll be there for them. (laughs) Anytime. Yeah. I was like, I don't want him to think I'm not available for him. Um, and, and I will, you know, obviously drop anything. Well, if they need me or if he's like, mom, I really want you to read me a book, um, before bed, then absolutely. Um, but sometimes it is nice to have your partner or even myself to be able to say, no, mommy's working right now. I just need five minutes. Um, so yeah, I'm just kind of teaching them that this is what work looks like for mom. Yeah. So, yeah. And I think they get it. And I totally agree with your, um, statement saying that like really, if they're getting all the love and affection that they need and they know you're coming from a good place, you know, then, then that means more to them than what you think it looks like of you sitting, working next to them. I think I felt like we put like the worst, um, thoughts into our heads about everything that we're doing because we're holding ourselves to like this unreachable standard. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, we want to be everything for everybody, especially our kids and, yeah, it's just a crazy balance that I don't even know if it ever does get in like an equal balance. It's like a give and take, I feel like, constantly. Totally. Yeah, I don't even like the word balance anymore because <laughs> you feel like you have it one day and then the next day you're like, wait a minute, where did it go? Like, what am I doing? So, yeah, I definitely want to write a piece on like balance as a unicorn because <laughs> it's like – this Mm -hmm. mythical thing that we're all looking for and it's like you know you can have it one day and then the next day situations or circumstances change and you got to figure it out again and and that's why I say like we need to have a little bit more grace with ourselves um because I I believe that if you are trying to find balance then you're probably doing a good job like just you're probably aware enough about your family and your kids and your life And that's a good thing. Yeah, just the pursuit of balance, not that you're actually achieving. I feel like that's the, that's kind of the, the theme in all areas. Like if you're pursuing, you know, personal development or getting better in yourself or pursuing um, a better um, relationship with your faith or whatever it is that I feel like just the pursuit in itself makes you have better a better personal life, better relationships, better self-love, like, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, Yeah. But I I think that the biggest shocker in marriage is, like, how much um, becoming more than just a couple changes things. And I know that you've blogged a little bit about this. um, But you and your husband have small kiddos, like you said, uh, five and 20 months. And so did that, like, totally rock your guys' world or – were you, or was that not even like an issue you just kind of rolled with? No, it definitely rocked our world. Not like we weren't ready. I, well, I don't know. I'm like, is anyone ever really ready to yeah. be a parent? Uh, we wanted children. So they were definitely planned. Um, 
but I feel like marriage is definitely a give and take, but it was like, you know, I was ready before him to have children and I kind of had to talk him into it a little bit. Like this is, you know, my biological clock is ticking big. (laughs) We want children. We better try now. And, And we got pregnant right away. And um, you know, it was always something that we wanted and, and we're so excited and felt actually really blessed to be able to get pregnant right away. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was really hard. Waylon had colic for five months and I, we just, I wrote about that actually. And while writing it, I realized like those five months of colic, we actually really were a good team. Like, they were super stressful. I'm sure we had plenty of fights, but when I recall and look back on it, I'm like, I just remember like being like a warrior with him, like just handing Waylon off when we would listen to heavy metal while the vacuum was playing while we're like bouncing on an exercise ball. (laughs) Okay. We were like soldiers together. (laughs) And, um, and we talk about it now with like almost like a fondness, like we really were a team together on that. Mm -hmm. Um, but I feel like maybe it was like other things in life like that make parenting really hard, you know, finances and work mm-hmm. and and then figuring out um, and you know, paying for health care and stuff like that. It's like all of that, the, those little stresses, I feel like sometimes in marriage make parenting harder um, because you're already like kind of stressed out and heightened. So it's easy to fight over other little things like parenting issues. But yeah, we've definitely had to, you know, talk about how we're going to parent. Um, if we, you know, believe in this or that, or if we, you know, we have to talk about those issues. And for the most part, we are definitely on the same page, but there are moments where, you know, we, we have to discuss things and, and talk about, um, how we want to raise our children. So yeah, it's, it's definitely not easy, but, um, I feel like it's probably the number one thing that's, um, made our marriage work is having children. So I want to know about colic because, and this is so random and, and I'm like going off on a whole different area, but I'm curious because we didn't, neither of my kids had colic, but I know that other, um, other mom friends of mine and other people that I know, they're either one of their children had colic or something, but it like, to- like when they talk about it, it's like, it's messing you up. <laughs> like, yeah. And, and so, and so how did you guys deal with having young ones? Did both of your kids have colic or just one? No. And that's actually how I talked Sam into number two, because I was like, <laughs> worse. And even if it was, we've already been there. We know how to do it. Like, so, um, yeah, Zeke was completely different as a baby. It was just amazing and refreshing, but, um, (laughs) yeah, I know colic was, um, gnarly. Definitely, definitely rocked us. Um, I feel like it was because Waylon was born three weeks early. And so I know his digestive tract wasn't fully developed. Doctors can never really tell you why it happens because it can happen to a full term baby. Um, but yeah, it was just so heartbreaking to see my baby, my first born child in so much pain, especially after he ate. Um, and I feel like as a new mom, I was just like, is this how it is? Like, is this how every baby is? Like, how do people have more children? I was like, this is insane. Um, So we did. We tried everything. We did, um, you know, we went to chiropractic care. I think we tried like, um, like warm tummy compresses and um, lots of swaddles and then eventually, um, had to put him on like a baby Zantac because he had acid reflux, which is really common that goes hand in hand with colic. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, but you know, it was like witching hour from like four to eight every night, just screaming nonstop. And, um, the best thing that really helped us was just family and friends that would come and help. And like, I would, I went and stayed with my parents that summer for a couple weeks and I just remember family being around and they were like, I've got him, I'll take him. And like, they would just swaddle him up and we would all take turns, like finding positions that would make him feel good. And like, I look back on that too now with like this fondness of like how, 
I don't know, maybe it's just God's love just showing like that even in a hard time, there are people there that love you and want to help you. And we all just felt so bad for him, even though it was like messing with our brain. Yeah. Like, we were, it's crazy. We can understand how people can lose it. And, you know, at the same time, you have that compassion for your baby that's in so much pain. Um, so I, that my number one, um, like advice for any mom dealing with colic is to reach out to people and to find someone that's dealt with it or going through it. I had a friend that had a baby like six months before me and she'd just gotten through it with her son. And so that was really the only thing that, um, gave me encouragement was I could just see that like there was light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> she had gotten through it. And like, you know, we would talk about different things that work cause there are little things that work here and there, but you know, it's basically time. You got to give your baby time to grow out of it. Well, that's awesome that you guys kind of warriored through that and came together as a couple. Has it always been easy for you guys to kind of unite in in parenting? Um, no, honestly, <laughs> it sounded so good. Though. I don't think I don't think it's ever been easy for us to come together and unite. Um, I think someday I always envision us as a couple in their fifties, and we'll be like, "Yes, we finally figured it out." <laughs> We finally get it. We get each other. Um, yeah, we're just both really headstrong people. Um, so it's never been easy, but I feel like our foundation is the same and that's what really matters because it's like, obviously we want, we both want the same things for our children. Mm -hmm. Um, and we both, um, trust God and we both, love each other and we know we're in it for the long haul. So I feel like those foundational like key things are what make it, um, work and what ultimately help us figure stuff out. But getting there has never been easy. So there are many nights where we're up just talking things through and, um, you know, praying about stuff and maybe, and even going to counseling. We've been to counseling many times, um, to help, figure out life and relationships and parenting too. So that's helped as well. And that's like super interesting to me because you're also, you're, a, you know, you're a marriage therapist, right? And a, yeah. so, marriage and family therapist, so yeah. how does that fit? Like, how does that play into your guys's marriage? Like, are you the one that can see things a little bit more clearly or communicate more clearly? Or is it totally different when it comes to your own relationships? It's so funny because marriage it, even though you're a marriage and family therapist, it's like I I cannot use any of the tools that I know <laughs> <laughs> that I can give someone else. What? <laughs> it's, it's so hard to do. It's so hard when you're in it mm. to like yeah. – I mean sometimes the tools will come after, but it's like, you know, when you're really – in it, it's hard to not react to things that upset you and to be like a therapist in your own relationship. But I feel like being a mom and a therapist, um, I feel like that might give me a little bit more, um, I don't know what's the word, like perspective on raising children because of, you know, I have seen a lot of, um, children come in with issues and, and I realize like, okay, this comes from that or this comes from this. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so sharing that with my husband, like, well, I want, you know, I don't want our son to be ashamed of his body or, you know, like, so I, I think that we should do this, this and this. And then he'll come back with like, well, I'm a man and this is what it feels like to be a man. And I'm like, okay, that's good to know because I didn't know that. <laughs> like I'm not a man. So I feel like he does respect the fact that I, um, know what I know from, you know, whatever being a therapist, but then at the same time, um, I do have to respect the fact that he is a father and that he knows things that I don't know. Um, and I think overall though, more than just being a therapist, it's just that I'm, I'm the mom and I'm home with them most of the day. And I, I feel like I get to see the ins and outs a little bit more. So, um, I think he respects that a little bit more that that carries way more weight than being a therapist <laughs> so that's awesome yeah. though that ability to see each, like to respect each other's knowledge and because I feel like sometimes that can be a stumbling block and I know that um you know when I sometimes when I give my husband unsolicited advice it is not wanted <laughs> you know I mean but yeah. but having the 
like as a whole, being able to ex- just um, respect each other's opinions. And that is like super helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And really that's just the main thing I feel like in relationship is respecting each other's opinions and it doesn't happen all the time. And, and a lot of times it's like, Oh wait, I need to go back and I need to remind myself like he's got his own opinion and that's okay. (laughs) It comes from his own experience. So Yeah. yeah. But that makes so much sense about, um, you know, not being able to use your therapy skills in your own marriage. Cause I feel like Like, I don't know. I feel like that's every, or maybe not everybody, but for me growing up, I could always tell my friends, like, don't date that guy. You're really, you know, this is what's wrong in your relationship. This is what you need to do. But then my own, like my own personal life, I couldn't figure it out. Like for the life of me, I was always a person that, um, everybody would go to for advice, but then I would never follow my own advice. Like even, even now my husband's like, have you listened to your own podcast lately? And I'm like, uh, <laughs> I'm like, okay, thanks, babe. Yes, that's, way to go. That, that's hilarious. Yeah, I know. I can like write something inspirational on my blog and be like, okay, I need to go back and read that and follow my own advice because I do that often too. Right. And I, but, but don't you feel like some of the things that you write, like when I blog or usually when I podcast, I say things that, um, sound super great and super inspirational sometimes or like, um, very positive or whatever. And most of the time it comes from having learned it from the, like previously and then, and then regurgitating it for myself. But then it just happens that, you know, I have a bunch of people listening to this podcast or, you know, reading my blog. And so it's like, I'm telling them, but really I'm writing it or telling it for me. (laughs) Yeah. I, I would say almost 100% of the time I'm writing something that I've learned recently. Um, I just recently wrote a piece for the Every Girl blog that will be up, I think, in like a week. But it was through like a year, this whole last year uh-huh. of learning about female competition and dealing with it. Mm-hmm. And and it was, you know, the piece is about how to celebrate other people's successes. Yeah. And, and in turn, that will help you grow in whatever you're doing in life. Um, and kind of, you know, finding community over competition. Uh, yeah. Uh, and I feel like that's always what I strive for. And I love being in community more than anything. But at the same time, there is a part of me that feels a little threatened when someone else like succeeds. And I'm like, Oh, I got to look at that in myself and figure out where does this come from? And, um, you know, I don't like that in me. And so I really dove deep the last year and did some research and, and, you know, found some really great wisdom on it. And that's where that piece came from. It was like learning, I feel like through my own experience of how can I love and accept and celebrate other people, other women when they succeed Mm -hmm. and, and not feel like, Oh, that's taking away from a piece of my pie. Cause it's not. Yeah. How, how have you been able to kind of change your perspective on that from thinking, that, you know, that kind of mindset of, oh, they're taking a piece from my pie, but then looking at it more as community as like, if one succeeds, like, that's great. Yeah, that's good for us all. Um, Just a little piece from from the article was about like neuroplasticity in the brain, meaning like the brain um, has the ability to change. So like when we have negative thoughts, um, recognize them and then ask yourself, where do they come from? And then change that negative thought to a positive one. And the more we do that, the more our brain can actually change. And then, you know, the thoughts that we have might not necessarily, not necessarily be, um, a threatening one when someone else succeeds. And and that's the goal eventually is to be like, wow, that's amazing. She's doing so well, or she started her podcast or she, you know, she started a blog and it looks so great. And like, I'm so happy for her. And you know, that doesn't mean I can't do it. Like, so I feel like the self-talk will change when you change the negative thinking. Um, because literally what you're doing is changing your brain. Um, you know, you're changing the, the pathways in your brain. And when you think about that, it's like pretty amazing. I'm like, okay, God, you made the brain so amazing. And, um, but it's hard because when you tell yourself stories for, for years, um, they become ingrained in your brain. And so that's why I feel like this, the key 
first step is to recognize it. So like I like to imagine like red flags going off. So like when I have this negative thought that I don't like, then I like kind of imagine like a red flag and I see it and I'm like, oh, okay, there's that. There's that in me that I don't like or I don't want there. Mm -hmm. And then I go in and I'm like, okay, where does that come from? Oh yeah, that comes from like that time in high school when so-and-so said this to me and it just really impacted me and or, you know, really upset me. And then I go in and think, okay, like, what's the, re- what's the truth? Okay. The truth is, is that she's doing awesome. And that that's exciting because I can do awesome too, you know, and, and, and I can learn from me. Maybe I can learn something from what they're doing. Yeah. And maybe, um, yeah. Yeah. Maybe that, that is out there for me too, because there is an endless piece mm-hmm. of joy or endless, endless amounts of creativity out there too. So I like to remind myself those kind of positive affirmations. Yeah. I think in the past year, I've kind of learned the same thing too, is trying to teach or remind myself that my gifts and other people's gifts are totally different. And we were all given our own individual gifts. So if I have, you know, the gift of whatever, I don't know, uh, like communication or something. And then, but my friend, you know, her house always looks like a Pinterest house. Like, well, maybe that's not my gift and that's great for her. And maybe I should have her come decorate my house, yeah. but I don't need to get down on myself because my house doesn't look like hers. Cause that's not my yeah. gift, you know? Exactly. Yeah. For a longest time I had a hard time with like cooking. Cause I'm not That's just not my gift. And I finally had to cook. I found so much freedom in saying like, I just don't cook. And I don't bake and that's okay. I don't have to. <laughs> I just felt like I was like less of a woman or less of a mother because mm-hmm. I just didn't always, you know, I don't bake home cooked meals all the time. My husband does. He's great at it. And I'm like, that's his gifting. And, um, yeah, I think that there's a little bit of freedom too in saying that, that like, this is where I thrive and this is where I'm good at and I don't have to be, um, good at everything or, um, like that person in that way. Yeah. This, but, this conversation but, yeah. totally reminds me of that movie, Bad Moms. Have you seen that? Oh my gosh. I was just talking to someone about it last night. It's so funny. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's like the best movie ever. But then you have like the mom who like never bakes. And so she brings who, I think it was Mila Kunis's character, right? I think where, um, yeah. she brought like cupcakes they were pre-bought and so she just took them out of the container and like put them on a plate and the moms are walking by like oh my gosh are those not gluten-free or something like that and I oh my gosh that movie is like yeah my I just love that movie I'm like yes these women are those are my people (laughs) yeah I know I think it's hard to um you know we live in a day and age where it's like okay that's you know, gluten-free, sugar-free, like all natural organic products. And it's like, yeah, that's a full-time job. Just like making your whole house organic. (laughs) Oh yeah. You're preaching. Yeah. My daughter can't have gluten. Well, yeah, she can't have gluten, dairy or eggs. And so, yeah. And so, and I'm the same way. I can't have gluten. So that uh, initially it was like, um, you know, like really overwhelming to learn how to cook a whole different way and to do everything a whole different way. Um, but it's so funny cause I still like people who don't know that we do it for a reason. That's how it looks. Is that like, Oh my gosh, like, right. you know? And so it's so funny. Like I find the humor in it and I think it's funny and I am that mom and at the, at our school, everybody yeah. knows me as like that mom and it's kind of like <laughs> a joke, you know? And, um, and I'm totally cool with it, but yeah, it's how, how ex- the extremes of it though are it just makes it hard to motherhood when you can't like unite in you know mm-hmm. in and like you said being um community over competition yeah yeah no I definitely like that's like a that's your thing that you have to do obviously for your health and and sometimes you have to um remind yourself that it's like, okay, this is what I'm choosing to, um, put more of my effort towards. And, and it's okay that I don't like excel in this area or yeah, yeah like it's okay. My house doesn't look like Pinterest right now. <laughs> yeah, I try, but mine just, I, I think I've gotten to a place where I'm like, you know what? 
this might be as good as it gets. And I'm proud of that. Like this. Yeah. Um, but I'm proud of that corner that looks really yeah. good. <laughs> then all of my Instagram photos will be from because, yeah. Exactly. I was just going to say, like, Pinterest and Instagram, remember that's just one section of someone's house. <laughs> one, you don't know what's beyond the border. Yeah. So. I love when I love when there's moms who post and they show, like, a before and after like this is what the you know this is what my picture looks like but if I showed you the whole room of where mm. I, this picture was taken you would notice there's piles of mess like on each side you know oh, so funny. yesterday I, I love Instagram stories for that yes. fact because I was like you know I like to post really pretty pictures but um because that's more of like the art side mm -hmm. for me is like okay this is like my my gallery, my magazine, and, and I love to make it look beautiful. And, but then the story part is just my favorite part of Instagram now, because yesterday I posted what our house looked like when we leave the house. And I just like did a whole scan of the room and I got so many messages back saying, thank you for this. I thought we were the only ones like, that's what our house looks like too. And I'm like, yeah, no, the key is like, it looks like this during the day. And then you know, right before everybody goes to bed, we clean it up. <laughs> so. Yeah, because there is no point in trying to pick that mess up in the middle of the yeah. day when a no, tornadoes are going to come through at any moment. And <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. So do you mm -hmm. have any, like, big lessons or takeaways from your profession in therapy that kind of you were able to apply to, you know, raising kids or your marriage that you feel like – gave you extreme insight hmm. from therapy yeah. or from my degree. Yeah. Um, uh, the word that sticks out for me would be empathy. Mm -hmm. Um, cause as a therapist, that is like your number one goal in like doing therapy with someone is to have empathy. And I had a professor describe it to me. The best way that I've heard was that empathy is, it's not sympathy because sympathy is feeling sorry for someone, but empathy is feeling with someone. Mm -hmm. And empathy, he said, is like having one foot in someone else's world and one foot in yours because you're not them. So you don't know exactly how they're feeling, but you can try and you can step into their world and try to understand them. And I loved it. It was just a beautiful image for me. Um, this was like before I was even married when I had heard that. And then when I got married and had children, it's, you know, obviously a lot harder to have empathy, um, every day for the people in your life. And sometimes, I mean, it's sad, but it's sometimes harder to have empathy for the people that are closest to you. Yeah. Um, and, but that's been the biggest thing that I feel like, you know, maybe God's been teaching me is to have empathy first with my, you know, marriage for my husband, um, to understand what he's going through. Um, meaning like, listen more and don't always have, don't always come back with an answer. Um, which is what I struggle with. Yes. <laughs> I always want to fix it. Like sometimes we swap roles in that way. Usually it's the man that just wants to fix things, but it's like for in our marriage, I'm like, well, let's do this and let's do that and let's fix it. And he's like, no, I just want you to listen to me. So, um, yeah, meaning to have empathy with my, um, for my husband. And then I feel like it, it comes really easy with my children. Um, but sometimes when there it's, you know, when the whining is not constant and the tantrums are happening with more frequency, that's when it gets harder to have empathy. And I feel like patience is, you know, what it looks like mm -hmm. on the outside, but empathy is, um, more of like when you think, okay, what is my child going through right now? What do they need? Mm -hmm. Like, are they really just trying to make my life miserable? No, probably not. They, they, they're feeling something right now. Like, and I think that helped us a lot with like the colic even and with the tantrums and in the toddler years with Waylon, I know, and now Zeke, like to know that like, okay, there are little people that are feeling lots of things. And that must be really hard for them. And so that's where I feel like it's easier for me to have patience with them. Um, and it has helped me greatly to be like, you know, what is my child going through right now? Let me kind of investigate and understand them. I want them to know that I'm like here for them. And so what that looks like in motherhood for me is like when my son 
or one of them is crying or screaming and it like looks like they're having a tantrum on the outside and you just want to be like, go to your room yeah. or you're going to get a spanking or whatever, you know, whatever kind of punishment you, you're like at your wits end sort of punishment, right. you know, that's yell out the threats and things and what it looks like in that moment to have empathy is, um, to sit, to be quiet with them, even if they're not being quiet and to maybe look them in the eye for me and my son way then it's like maybe to like hold him because he wants that. He, he needs me to calm him down and, and to say, breathe. Like I said, breathe. And, and then I say like, wow, like it looks like you're having a really hard time right now. What's going on? Mm -hmm. Like, so acknowledging that he has a lot of feelings and then asking like what's going on. That's empathy for me in, in motherhood. So yeah, yeah. we ha and I noticed you just said like you're explaining to him basically what he's feeling with in a way that's like not telling him um what he's feeling if that if that makes sense like yeah, but I had exactly. we had a um I was in like a Bible study with a group of women and one of the girls was going to I think she was getting her license in uh like play therapy for children and mm -hmm. so for one of her assignments she had to um you know, have like a, a mock session with a child that she didn't know. And so she knew I had, um, a toddler. And so she asked if she could, um, come over and, you know, have like a little session with him. And I noticed like throughout the whole time that she was here, he, whenever he did something, she would tell him like basically mm -hmm. what he just did, you know, or kind of like make him aware of the things that he was yeah. doing or the things that he was feeling. Yes. Kids love that. Um, I learned a lot too, like in play therapy, one of the main things is to narrate, like play what they're doing and, and they love it. And I, f I think they love it maybe because they feel that's to them. Um, it's the signal that you are with them and that you're seeing them and hearing them and understanding them. Yeah. And I think that's what, I think that's what we all want. But yeah, and it's it's hard as parents and adults to look at children and understand that sometimes because it looks like they're out of control or they're just little people and they don't know anything. But it's like, no, they're people and they have feelings and emotions. And, you know, sometimes we want to just yell out, you know, the idle threat of um, punishment or, you know, like come up with the most extreme punishment in our head. Mm -hmm. But it's like, no, what you really need is like to sit in that moment with them and, and, and to allow them to calm down, um, you know, or, or remove them from the situation. That's the other way to deal with tantrums, I think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There have been many times where I text my husband in the middle of the day or, you know, and I'm like, when you come home, the children are probably going to be duct taped to the wall. <laughs> of course, I would never do that. So don't call CPS on me, anybody who's listening. But like, yeah. but you know, there, I mean, for me, sometimes it's better for me to like joke about the situation, even if I have to send my husband a text and like, I'm going to, you know, put your kids outside or, you know, sell your kids to the neighbor or something like that or yeah. that. And then like he texts me something funny back and that kind of helps me to laugh about it and get out of my head about you know, the, yeah. the stress of it all or whatever. Oh, totally. Yeah. There are many, many texts I've sent like that too, where I'm like, okay, I'm out of patience. I can't do it anymore. You need tag team. You're it. Yeah, yep. <laughs> Come home. That's what so, we say all the yeah. time. I'm like, Oh, you're up your turn. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So anyone who's listening, don't feel like you have to do that all the time. Cause like, if you, if you're depleted, it's very hard to have empathy. Oh yeah. I've learned, I've learned that. So yeah, if you need a break, if you need a breather, there's no shame in asking for that. So. Or going to your closet and eating chocolate. <laughs> exactly. Or doing that if your husband's gone <laughs> for a while. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you did blog a little bit about anxiety. And so I wanted to ask you a few questions about that and like where you thought your anxiety stemmed from. Yes. Okay. Oh, I'll try to get through this without crying. Um, <laughs> it's, I don't know. It's just a real, I'm definitely not afraid to talk about it. I want people to know, especially mothers, that anxiety is real and you're not alone. I never had anxiety before at children. Um, and I had, so I had some complications with Waylon 29 weeks. I had like a placenta abruption 
and I had to be on bed rest from then on out. And that was like the first time I felt like, oh, I could lose my child and that feeling of, wow, what would that do to me? Um, and that was scary having, if I had to go through that again now, I probably would have way more anxiety about it because now I know exactly what I would be losing. Um, but I had a particular incident when Waylon was like 18 months old. Um, he, we went to visit my parents, um, at my home church and he was so fast. Like I, I always like disclaim it by saying like, I was right behind him and he was so fast. He ran around the corner. Um, and I was like right behind him, but I turned the corner and he was gone. And, um, we looked all around the church and like they were, in, it was after church. And so they had gotten everybody that was around to look for him. And, and then by that time it got to the scary point where you're like, okay, like 10 minutes have gone by, like, where's my toddler? Yeah. Um, and I was just very frightened to even go look in the street. And, um, and then, um, someone, it was a really bad case of mistaken identity, but a mother went out and asked these little boys out front that were playing, like if they had seen this boy and they said, Oh yeah, a man took him in his car. And so that came, she was panicked and came back and had said that. And I lost my mind, literally <laughs> lost yeah. my mind. And I was, I was just like a primal woman wailing and screaming because I had thought my son was kidnapped and and so the police were called and um luckily (laughs) a few minutes later they had found him they saw his little feet behind this door and he had went into this copy room and shut the door and um it was it locked automatically behind him Mm -hmm. Uh, but someone saw his feet and I just remember my mom saying okay Chrissy he's here. We found him. And, oh my gosh. Like, Oh, uh, like I just, um, going back there is a bad, bad place to go back to. But I, that was the first moment like that I realized I could lose my child yeah. and, um, and just, I, Oh, like hugging him, um, and going back there. Yeah. It's like really hard to, but I, I can pinpoint now where the anxiety comes from. So it is a mixture of PTSD for sure. Um, but through that anxiety, it just grew and it spread to other things like, um, you know, a fear of flying or like a fear of like, um, what do people think of me? Or like, it just totally generalized from there. And so I can pinpoint exactly where it came from. And it all is the fear that I will lose my child or, um, in, in essence, I will lose myself. And it's been a a journey to like figure out, um, how to get through it, how to deal with it and then how to live differently. Because even though it might be there in my life for the rest of my life, I don't want to live with, I don't want to like white knuckle it through life. And I feel like God's really been teaching me that he loves my children more than I do. Mm -hmm. And that Mm -hmm. is like a thought that has helped me when I get anxious at the park. Cause like, I can't see my kid for a second. <laughs> then I, I do have to like remind myself to breathe and like, everything's okay. And like, you know, God loves my children more than he loves me. Um, or more than he, more than I do. Um, not more than he loves me. Yeah, he loves me. <laughs> I, um, I was just thinking about recently I, I had to fly to Hawaii, um, to be with my sister because her youngest had, went into cardiac arrest and it was such a scary time. And I, I put myself in her shoes and like, you know, the panic and the anxiety, like just waves of it came back, but I wanted to be there for her. And Sam said, go and be there for her. And so I left him with the boys and they were totally fine. But, you know, of course me and my mom anxiety, like and hopping on an airplane by myself was like really huge. Yeah. Um, and then just being away from them, like having this ocean separating us was like really anxiety ridden. But overall, I kept hearing that God say to me, like, I'm good and I've got this and I'm good. And it was literally was such an amazing time to be over there because I saw him work in ways that I had never seen him work before. Like he healed my nephew and I saw the church and like literally saw people from the church, like as his arms wrapping us with prayer and food and love and comfort and money and help. And it was like his 
it was like a lesson for me. I feel like of God, like, see this, see this, this is me. I'm good. Mm. And, um, I feel like that's been the most helpful for me and my anxiety is like, I tell myself that when anxiety pops up, I tell myself, okay, like this is okay. Like it's anxiety. It's just anxiety. It's, it doesn't mean that, um, the worst is going to happen. And, and then I go back to the fact that he's a good, good father. Yeah. And, um, that's been the most help for me, but I'm definitely a big proponent on therapy. And even if you have to do medication, you know, there are times where I've had to go on medication to help myself, um, to feel more grounded, to, um, just have more balance, like mentally more like, you know, balance. And, um, yeah, that's where definitely anxiety and motherhood. I'm like, wow, no one tells you when you have a child. And, and they, yeah. Oh my gosh. It's so, well, and I mean, I don't, holy cow. Yeah. When you were telling me that like the woman came back or like the kid said that my stomach just like dropped, you know, cause I obviously I didn't know the ending of the story and I'm like, oh no. So I didn't know where it was going to go. And I just like, was like, oh my gosh. But I remember, I don't remember which kid it was, but one of my kids I lost in Target, you know, and I just Mm -hmm. like turned around for a second and then they were gone. And I was like, freaking out and I mean like just the thought of okay did somebody take them did they run outside the building if I run outside the building like am I gonna miss them are they gonna like you never realize how much you love something until you have kids and it's like Mm -hmm. an insane feeling to have no control over their like their life basically or their survival I don't know but um and then I remember finding finding them and I was just like bawling <laughs> like in the middle of Target because yes. I was like I was just, it was like because you know you just go from like freaking high your emotion just like peaks to where it's like I will turn over every single aisle in this place like you know you're oh. like in mom mode and then and then to have that all erased in a second your kid back in your arms you're just like re- yeah. relieved and oh my gosh it's so nothing crazy. else matters <laughs> nothing yeah. else matters uh, and you're just like, okay, you know, that puts it all in perspective. Yeah. My children are here and they're safe and they're healthy. And yeah, I think every day to it, like helps me, um, put things in perspective and just really, um, soak in that, like my kids are okay and they're here. And so many parents, um, you know, have kids in the hospital or, you know, have maybe even lost a child, like whether miscarriage or, you know, you name it. But, um, yeah, I think it does. It it really put things in perspective for me of like, um, just how precious it is to be like a mother and my children mean so much to me, but then I do know that it's like, okay, I cannot, um, like have the idol of control. Maybe I don't know where that came from. It was like, it has been an idol and it's because I want to control everything and I want to know that everything's going to be okay. And that's not guaranteed in this life. And the only way that I know I'm going to get through (laughs) this life is by trusting in a a good God that, um, that wants me to have a good life. And I have so many friends that I, you know, um, or a few good friends that I really divulge, um, you know, this kind of information to, and they will just tell me straight, like, that's not what God wants for you. You know that he's got good things for you. And, and that helps too to be able to talk to your, your mom friends about, um, those crazy weird anxieties and, Mm -hmm. and all that. So you definitely, I, I, I would say be open about it. If you're struggling with anxiety, like don't be afraid to talk about it, whether it's with your mom group of friends or in a Bible study or, in a Facebook group or with a therapist, like definitely be open and talk about it. Cause you're not alone. What have you, like, what have you learned this far about your, about overcoming anxiety at this phase in your life now? Um, I've learned that it might always be there. Um, and that that's okay. Cause it doesn't mean it's always going to be bad. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a certain therapy I learned, um, in grad school called acceptance and commitment therapy. And it's like so funny because it sounds counterintuitive, but you're supposed to accept the things in your life that you don't like, like anxiety or depression. And in turn, the idea is that the more you accept it, 
um, the more or the less it will affect you in life. Mm. Um, so anxiety sometimes for me is like panic. It feels like panic or panic disorder or, and, um, and for me, the best thing to do in that moment when I feel it is to say like, okay, there it is not, Oh my gosh, there it is. I'm going to die. And everything is going to collapse around me and my children are going to be kidnapped or, you know, all the negative things. (laughs) It's just to be like, Oh, okay, there it is. That's anxiety. Okay. That's, that's what happens sometimes in my body when I feel this or that. Mm -hmm. And so it's like more of like not judging things, just looking at what I feel and labeling it and then saying, okay. And then breathe and then remind myself of truths. So I feel like that's the biggest thing that I've learned. Um, and it's funny because it started out learning it just clinically in grad school. And now I'm like, oh, now I actually have to utilize these <laughs> things that I tell clients to do because it's happened and it's real. Yeah. And that is, you know, I don't know. Like, I don't think God makes things happen to us. But I think like this, um, but I think I can use it. I think I can learn from it and be like, you know, I know exactly what that feels like. I know exactly what a panic attack feels like and, and have more empathy for people in general. Yeah. Oh my gosh. This reminds me of a, I recently recorded with a woman, Anna Donaldson, and she wrote a book called a rare bird or no, not a rare bird, just rare bird. And, um, it was about losing her son and he was 12 and he drowned in a Creek, um, Mm -hmm. by their house. And so basically, I mean, but she kind of talks about the same thing about kind of there'll be a period in time where you kind of beat yourself up and you think like, what if I did this or what if this happens or what if I had done that? And then she talks about kind of overcoming that process and that you can't do that to yourself because there's a lot of things you don't have control over. But um, it definitely gave me perspective and also kind of like I remember after interview or after interviewing her. Um, and after re- like reading her book, I would cry. Like I was just bawling, putting my kid down. Cause ultimately I don't have control, but I, f- I feel like the thing that I've learned the most is to, um, just like love them every day and to pour everything that I have into them and to enjoy them. Because if I spend too much time worrying about the future, then I'm going to miss what's happening exactly. right now. Yeah, exactly. I've, I've learned that definitely like the present moment. I think I wrote that in an email to you about the book, you know, present over per- perfect by Sean and Nyquist that I like really resonated with that book because I, I want so badly to, to savor the present moment. And that's, it's hard in itself and it's not, um, you know, possible to do every day, all day, but to be more aware of it, that like, this is what we have. And, um, that is actually a, a very big tool in dealing with anxiety that I've learned to help me is like, okay, cause anxiety is living in the future. I feel like it's living in the future and, and things that haven't even happened. Um, that's been my experience. And so when I come back to the present moment, whether I'm on an airplane yeah. <laughs> or doing something else that gives me anxiety, I remind myself like, nope, this is what's happening right here. I'm Okay. Like nothing, not the, the horrible things in my mind that I think are going to happen aren't happening right now. <laughs> so yeah, being, coming back to the present moment is huge um, and definitely helpful in dealing with anxiety. Well, that is like the perfect leeway into the next few questions that I wanted to ask you. But before I ask you those, um, I just want to thank you for, and acknowledge you for um, being like such a transparent Instagrammer and a blogger because I feel like sometimes we get caught up in this like comparison between strangers that are on social media because their pictures are beautiful and you have beautiful pictures. But then when you read your captions, that's like real life and you share real life and you're not afraid to talk to people. And I appreciate that because, you know, like for mom, for (laughs) me and I know for other moms, like we need to be reminded that we're not alone and, um, and yeah. yeah, and that we all struggle the same thing. So man, you're doing an awesome job and I appreciate, I appreciate you. <laughs> that means so much to me. Cause I, um, yeah, it's a huge compliment to hear that. Cause I feel like that's really what I strive for. Like the art side of me and the, um, you know, the creative person in me wants to create beautiful things. But then at the same time, I'm like, I overall want to be a person that doesn't make anybody else feel bad. 
about themselves or their lives. I just want to inspire and encourage. So I feel like maybe the mixture with, you know, of words with the images, um, and, and my real life stories <laughs> <laughs> that maybe that's the, the healthy balance of it all. And I'm so glad that you think that. So thank you. So I wanted to ask you, um, if you could pick the most influential book that you've read, what would it be? Oh, right now I would have to say Heart Made Whole by Krista Block Gifford. I just finished it and I want to pick it up and read it again. Um, yeah, I feel like it just helped me, um, with so many things, like so many different, like it's, it's really, the book is about, um, healing yourself or not healing yourself, but, um, how to deal with unhealed pain Mm. in your life. And ultimately it's God that does that. And she talks in the book about her traumas and how she, um, didn't let it destroy her. You know, she, she lost a daughter in childbirth and, Mm -hmm. and she talks about her experience of how she walked through God. So with God, so intimately through that experience of trauma And, and for me, like so much of anxiety is like, what would I, what would I be? Or how would I respond if something like that happened to me? And the way she talked about it was just so comforting to someone who hasn't experienced that trauma, but you know, is afraid of things. And, and it was just like, wow, that's the kind of God we, um, you know, have is one that is a loving father that wants to like hold us in those moments where we're in pain. Um, but yeah, I just loved how she wrote, um, about her personal story, but just also how she dealt with unhealed pain in her life. Cause we all have it. We all have it from childhood and, yeah. you know, different experiences in life that has made us tell ourselves different, you know, negative stories or wrong stories about ourselves. But, um, yeah, I love that book so much. I like gifted it already to a couple people. Cause I'm like, this is so good. <laughs> So, yeah, and actually I really liked in the book, after each chapter, she calls it heart surgery, Mm -hmm. and she asks these deep questions, um, and I journaled every time about them, and I answered them, and I feel like maybe that was the meat of it. Maybe that's why I loved Mm -hmm. it so much. It actually helped me do some heart surgery on myself, like um, asking myself, like, why why do I think that, or how do I, you know, um, what do I think about this? So it was really good. Yeah. Heart made whole. Man, women are like such warriors. When I think about (laughs) her and her book and then, you know, just what you've overcome and what you're doing and then um, all the women that I've interviewed, I'm just like, we are some crazy, awesome (laughs) warriors. Like we all have different things that we've overcome and it's just, it's so awesome. Anyway. Yeah. Um, If you could empower women in one way, what would it be? I would want women to know that they're enough, um, that they're good enough, like pretty enough, smart enough, lovely enough, like (laughs) that they, you know, are worthy of what they want to do and what they want to have. Um, but yeah, I think enough is the word that comes to mind of what I would want women to know. Um, and then I would also want them to know, like, if you want to do something, do it don't wait till like you feel like you're good enough. Like if you want to take photos and be a photographer, do it. If you want to start a blog and write, do it. If you want to work part time, because that's going to give you joy being a barista while having children or whatever, do it. Like I feel like life is too short to wait for things to like be perfect. Um, or to wait till to feel like you're good enough. Um, with blogging. Oh my gosh, I started and I didn't even know what I was doing, but like I have learned along the way. Um, and I still don't know half the time what I'm doing, but, um, it's just fun. It's fun learning. And I'm so glad that I have that as an outlet. Um, and I, I've talked to so many different women that are like, well, I want to do it, but so many people are doing it or, you know, I want to do this, but I don't know how, um, you know, just YouTube it, Google it. Like literally that's how I figure out some of the things oh, yeah. <laughs> on, yeah. like, I, I Google all the yes. time or YouTube things. Um, so yeah, I would just let women know that they, um, you know, if you're, if you have a desire for something, it's probably because you're supposed to be doing something 
in that field or realm of, you know, whatever that desire is. So, um, do it, start it. That's what I would say. If you could tell your younger self one thing, assuming that she would listen, what would it be? Oh my gosh. This is such a good (laughs) question. I would tell myself you're, you're okay. Mm. Like you're okay. And you're going to be okay. Um, yeah, I think every phase in my life I can look back and, you know, from having an eating disorder in college to, you know, being worried that I was never going to meet my husband to then being worried that like, I would never figure out what I wanted to do with my career. I would just tell myself like, you're okay. And it's, it's all going to be okay. You're so awesome. I had no idea. How this... <laughs> I'm like, wait, how did we not talk about all those things? No, but um, I know. I'm sorry. I slept the eating disorder. That, but no, but that, I mean, that just goes back to that. Like, we are such warriors. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. We need our own. We need our own like warrior bad moms mix remix <laughs> movie or something. I don't know. Um, yeah. So, where can everybody find you on social media? Where can they read your blog and follow you? All that good stuff. Yes. Okay. So my blog is just chrissypowers.com. That's C-H-R-I-S-S-Y-P-O-W-E-R-S.com. And then if you go there, you can see my Instagram feed and you could click on that and follow me if you want. It's Chrissy J Powers. I had to use my middle initial there. So that's Dang I'm those other Instagram. Chrissy Powers. <laughs> Those other cars, let's take it. Um, I believe Twitter too, which I don't really understand Twitter, yeah. but basically my Instagram feed is on Twitter at Chrissy J Powers as well. And then I'm on like, you know, Pinterest and um, Facebook at just Chrissy Powers. So yeah, and that's where you guys can find me and feel free to like reach out to me. I would love to know if you listen to this or um yeah, just answer any questions you guys might have too. So yeah, that'd be awesome. And I'm also going to link your article um, from the Everyday Girl that you're that's about to come out because this episode oh, won't yeah. air until after it comes out. And so I would love to have that in the show notes oh, um, so we can read it and share it. Um, love that. Thank but you. Yeah. So thank you for hanging out with me. I'm so appreciative of it. Yeah, this is my first podcast. I'm so stoked. I'm excited to do this. So thank you. I hope you guys enjoyed that episode. Make sure you check out Chrissy's show notes page at todayseden.com slash podcasts, P-O-D-C-A-S-T-S slash 026. And there I will link the article that she wrote for The Everyday Girl, also her favorite books, how you can follow Chrissy on Instagram, because you guys, that is a gorgeous feed that she has created, obviously as a photographer, but it's just amazing. I love it, and I love following her. Also, want to make sure that you guys are checking out the Today's Eden Tribe Facebook group. You can go to todayseden.com and go to the top menu bar, click Today's Eden Tribe, and there you can join our Facebook group where we kind of hang out and talk about real stuff just like we do on here, but with each other. Lastly, if you've been listening into this podcast and you've been enjoying it, I just want to let you know that I truly appreciate you and I honestly want to get to know every single one of you. So I hope you do join the Facebook group, but I ask that you share this podcast with your friends or your family, anybody who you think that might benefit from joining us in the conversations that we're having, whether it be on the podcast or in the Facebook group. And I also would love it if you could leave a review or rating on iTunes. You guys, that is how people can find my podcast better is by giving it a rating. So that way iTunes makes this podcast more visible on the podcast lists. And in turn, more women get to hear these awesome stories from these awesome women that are sharing their journeys on this podcast. And the quote I want to leave with you today is motherhood is a choice you make every day to put someone else's happiness and well-being ahead of your own, to teach the hard lessons, to do the right thing, even when you're not sure what is the right thing, and to forgive yourself over and over again for doing everything wrong. Thanks for listening. And I hope you guys tune in again next Wednesday.